Hello and welcome to Ways to Change the World. I'm Krishna Giri Murphy and this is the podcast in which we talk to remarkable people about the big ideas in their lives and the events in their lives that have helped shape all of that. And my guest today is a man who used to work on Channel 4 News. Safraz Manzoor is a writer, a journalist, but right now he is known as the man behind Blinded by the Light, the movie about a young teenage Pakistani boy in Luton who has dreams and then discovers Bruce Springsteen, and that transforms everything. And, and, and th that is basically the truth, isn't it, of your life? It is, yeah. I mean, a, a film sort of dramatises things and uh, heightens them, but that is the core cool story. Growing up in Luton in the 1980s with a very working-class dad who worked on a Vauxhall car factory and a mum who made dresses at home, and in a world where most of the people we knew were taxi drivers and worked in factories and what have you, and, and wondering whether that was just as big a life and as, as far as one could go in terms of dreaming. And... Uh, yeah, and thinking, you know, watching things on the TV screen and thinking who gets to be on the other side of that screen and looking at things in the newspaper and saying, I wonder who gets to actually write stuff like that. So all that stuff didn't really feel possible when I was growing up. And then, yeah, at 16, somebody introduced me to music of Springsteen. And I think that did actually have an impact in terms of helping shape why I'm here now. What was it you saw when you listened to those cassette tapes for the first time? You know, I've been thinking about this quite a lot. And I think that, you know, when you're 16, you can be quite impressionable. Um, and some people sort of get into religion and they get kind of really into that. And and I think what it was with me was I didn't have, I had an older brother, but he wasn't somebody who could introduce me to anything particularly. And my dad was not the, that kind of person. And I just think if you live in a world which feels small and closed, you need something which acts like a window to another world. And it could be a filmmaker, it could be a book, it could be could be somebody you might know in your family who could who does something interesting and I didn't have any of those and so I think looking back on it I think what Springsteen did was just open a window to a different place and just make it seem like it might be possible to get to that other place and because he came from a working class background and because you know he didn't have very good relationships with his dad I just saw some similarities but also some hope so I think that's what he did. I think he opens a window. I mean, Blinded by the Light is a, is a feel-good movie directed by Gorinda Chadder, who did Bend It Like Beckham. I mean, it's it's romantic. Um, and it deals with a lot of the grittiness of the time and the racism of the time. Yeah. But, but but for me, a lot, a lot of the film is actually about a kid who is um, kind of rejecting quite a lot, rejecting quite a lot of where he comes from and where he is yeah. and wants to escape everything. Yeah. Um, why, why were you in that situation? You know, why, See, why were you not comfortable with who you were? So I think what it is, is that if you grow up as a second generation per immigrant, you often have parents, and my dad was somebody like this, who was very clear about his identity. And his identity was Pakistani, and this was just the country he lived in. And I think also that there was a certain desire to protect and preserve that kind of background. So I grew up, having people outside, English, white people, politicians, etc., saying people like you don't really fully belong and you don't have as much right to call yourself British as anybody else. And, you, know, you can just about deal with that. But then I also had that from my own dad saying, you're not really British, you're Pakistani, don't ever forget that. And, you know, I think if you're 16, you kind of want to belong, don't you? You want to be like everybody else. You don't want to sort of be the person that sort of... So the reason I was rejecting it is because I wanted to be like my mates. You I wanted, wanted to be British. I wanted to be British, and I didn't want to have to feel like somehow I had an allegiance to something that I didn't authentically feel. If you've left something, if literally all your memories are of this country, if all your mates are white, and then your dad is telling you you can't really trust white people, they'll, they'll work with you, but they'll never be your friends, and it doesn't speak to your reality then that's I guess that's why I rejected it and also it's quite a nihilistic view you know I kind of wanted to believe there was more to this world and um, and I think part of the reason was that people like my dad they were intelligent and they had some abilities but they weren't allowed to use those abilities for, for reasons outside of their control and I think they were probably worried that their children would also face that level of disillusionment and so they just thought stick to what you know stick to the identity that we've given you and not don't try and pretend to be something else but so so did you feel british or did you or, or, or was it that you wanted to be british and, and i think i wanted to and i don't think i felt it and remember these are the times this is the time of 
Thatcher. This is the time of Land of Hope and Glory being played all over in the Conservative Party conferences. And also, this is a time without any role models as well. Because I do think that if you see people who look a bit like you out there in the world doing different things, then you can feel more embedded in the society you're in. But if your political representatives and if the people who you read and if you watch, if they're not from your background either, then your ability to hold on or cling on to this idea that this is my identity as well, I think it feels more implausible and it feels more tenuous. So I wouldn't say I necessarily felt it, but I also, the worry was I didn't feel that, but I didn't feel anything else either. It wasn't like I felt a kindredness or a link to Pakistan or something because I didn't feel that either. So there is this sort of no man's land you fall into where you're not really being accepted either way. Did, did you go to Pakistan at all? Yeah, I did. I, the first time I went to Pakistan was in the winter of 1985 and I was 14 years old and I remember it really clearly because I was terrified of the otherness that I was going to face. And the way I protected myself with the otherness was I recorded, I was a big fan of um, uh, Steve Wright in the Afternoon, the Radio 1 show, and I recorded two weeks of the show on blank cassettes as a way of having something from this world <laughs> to take that I could in. take home. And I was like, you know, to take to Pakistan. And I said, you know what, I'm going to listen to them all. I'm going to listen to a little bit each day, and that will help my time. Because I felt like I was in such a foreign place. And I wanted a reminder. This is obviously before the internet, before Skype, etc. And there was just this overwhelming otherness about it. And I was so scared of it because all I knew was this country. And I just tried, I remember trying to hold on to something that felt intrinsically British to, to go there. But what, why do you think your experience then was so different from so many other people your, your age? Because some, I don't like second generation immigrant as a phrase, to be honest, but some, some children of immigrants mm. took on their parents' identity mm. and didn't assimilate, didn't become... British yeah. in, in that way. Um, others, uh, you know, have, have done what you've done. I mean, was it was it the way you were brought up? I mean, because I mean, I see a lot of my own, uh, albeit my upbringing was quite different to yours in the north yeah. of England, and my dad was a doctor, and we were better off, and all the rest of it. But but lots of um, lots of similarities in terms of cultural, yeah, um, you know, anchor points. And my my parents didn't you know, tried to get me to be as British as they could. Yeah. So it was quite different. They, they tried to get you to be more? Yes. Okay. Uh, but, the, but then they then they also kind of um, were worried by what they'd created. Yeah. You know, that I wasn't Indian enough. That they'd lost you in some way. Yeah. Yeah. So what, why do you think you had, you know, you ended up in that situation? Was it the way you were brought up? I think... Or was to, it you? I mean, I, I think some of it must have been me, but I do also think that it's about... The, the, the social world you move into. So from the age of eight, I was in a very Asian area. And the age of nine, I moved to a school that was very, very white. So suddenly all my friends were white. And I was literally the only Asian pretty much in the class. And also, I, I, I've, been, I've been researching a new book that I'm working on. And I've been traveling around a lot of communities in this country. And it's interesting how many Muslim kids are still going to mosque after school every day, you know. I didn't do any of that because we lived away from the mosque and my mum just taught me the Quran. So I wasn't exposed full on to that world of, of the Asian or the Muslim world. And I was exposed to much more of a white world. And I think perhaps my expectations and my ideas and my hopes started blending in with that. But I just wanted to pick up on that thing that you just said about your parents, because I think there's an interesting thing that if you get too close to the culture, there are some, you know, there can be some consequences. But if you get too far, there can also be. So, for example, I'm really pleased that I can actually speak Urdu. Because my mum and dad used to say to me, you've got your own language. In this house, you're not speaking English to us, you know. And so that's why I can speak it. But other people weren't taught that. Yeah, I don't got... speak any language. And, also, and does that, is that a source of regret to you? Yeah, it, it's, it is a regret. I mean, it's actually a matter of circumstance rather than anything else. Because my mum and dad come from different parts of India. And so they don't speak the same language and my dad speaks Tamil which is quite a little spoken language across India yeah. and they didn't think there was any he doesn't speak Hindi which is the language that would be sensible to learn and so there was no spoken Hindi in the house so they couldn't do that thing of, yeah in the house we're going to speak Hindi <laughs> yeah because my dad didn't speak it so but and it is it's embarrassing when I go to India and, and a matter of regret that I don't speak it because there's some cultural anchor point there that I don't have. And then yeah, suppose so you can't watch Indian films, films in that watch same Indian way. Films, yeah. Yes. And I loved all that. I did love that. But I, I mean, I, what I'm getting at, I suppose, is were you embarrassed By... about being Pakistani? Well, I wasn't proud of it. Um, 
I don't think I was. I think I was. I wasn't embarrassed by being Pakistani. I think I was disappointed with the consequences and the implications of that. What that meant. So, for example, you know, if being Pakistani meant that you didn't get Christmas presents, I was a bit embarrassed when you know we. I don't know if you remember, we used to have to, if you go to school in the last week just before Christmas, you could bring your school present, your Christmas presents in. And I didn't have any because we were proudly told we don't get Christmas presents. So it was a bit embarrassing when everyone else was playing presents, you know, having presents and, and you're not. So it wasn't a kind of existential embarrassment, if that's, you know, if that's yeah. what you mean. It was more like a practical thing. Like if being Pakistani means dot, 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 I'm not very happy about it. And also, I suppose the other thing was, I wasn't, it, was, it seemed to be very hard to find anything to be proud of. You know, even with India, for example, I've, I was thought with India, you've just got this incredible country. You've got all this history. You've got this. Thing. So there's something you can feel proud of. But Pakistan, I thought it's only 70 years old. It's like it was quite hard to find what are the things that I'm actively meant to feel proud of, even about the nation. Um, and so those things, are they do kind of flow around. But then the problem is that you don't want to be one of these people that sort of runs towards another country or runs towards a British identity when the when you're being told that they're actually going to be laughing at you they're never going to in, in belong you're not going to belong to them either um because what my dad used to say is they will never accept you so there's this sort of mid midpoint that you kind of fall into and so when you were called packy mm. um how did you feel as a kid see i was quite lucky because i never really had that much extreme like racism i mean i, I had things like it's really interesting because like i was one of these people in school who knew the popular kids, like the, you know, the grade A social kids. So by association, I became, I guess, about B or you know, B minus or something. So that meant that like, there was a kid I remember and he used to spit in the face of any Asian kid. And well. that's in the film. It's in the film. Um, but that didn't directly happen to me. He, he wouldn't do it to me because he was also friends with my mates. So I, I didn't have that much of that sort of stuff. I remember things like, there was a teacher, I should I can't remember his name still. And he kind of started talking about short words being shortened, but still retaining the same meaning, you know. And he sort of did say to me, so, Safra, so you know, you know that Paki is basically short for Pakistani. And sort of listened long. And he said, so technically you are a Paki. And I remember the burning feeling of embarrassment because it sounded like he was making a sort of a casual, logical, rhetorical point but feeling like he was actually making a kind of more racist pointed point you know and i do remember that which really, obviously he was which he really was and that's a searing thing to see when you could just feel everybody burning but being powerless to say anything about it you know um so there was quite a lot of those kind of things going on and i also but the other thing i remember like again the consequences thing i remember reading the local paper the herald and always looking at the marriages the weddings page and always looking for somebody who was black or brown who was married to a white person because we never ever saw any of that in my life and i was just raised to believe that it was going to be um, an arranged marriage so i was like always seeing has any, does anyone ever marry out, anyone outside of the community so those are the examples where you sort of are searching for something different and looking for any kind of evidence that there might be something out there because again the the, the film um you know has the, your your character again, in this situation where he has to sort of run away from what his parents want. Yeah. Did you feel you had to run away from what they wanted? Whether it was an arranged marriage or... Yeah, I did. But the tricky thing is, you see, because I think that, and I know that maybe the second generation is not the right word, but I definitely feel like if you're the pair, if you're the child of immigrants who have in some way struggled, um, it doesn't matter which culture they come from, I just think there's often a lot of guilt attached because you know that they've really, really sacrificed. So my whole thing was, how do I do something different whilst at the same time not completely burning my bridges with them? So, and that's a really, really tricky thing. And I'll be honest with you, that's something which is a work in progress. That is not, there is, you know, there might be a happy ending in the film. There's not a happy ending in my life. That is a work in progress, you know? I'll give you an example. It's my mum's birthday today. And... Um, you know, I, there's a bit of me that feels really guilty that I've just been involved in a film which sort of praises her and lauds her and tells us, tells the world how amazing she is. But do I go home enough? You know, or do I actually just let my brother look after her most of the time and go home occasionally to make sure that she's okay? Are you seeing your mother today? I'm not seeing my mother no. today. I'm doing a lot of promo for this film. So that's an example of that. And so there's a lot of that sort of thing that you think, you know, it's all lip service, isn't it? And am I really doing enough in my real world about it? So this is a work in progress. 
in that sense, yeah, I did feel like, you know, if your parents basically raised you to believe you need to marry somebody from a village back in Pakistan and you don't want to do that, you kind of do need to run away from that, you know? Um, if your parents tell you that the job to do is something that's going to have a lot of status, it's going to be ultimately drudgery and dull, but eventually when you retire, you might be able to do something you might want to do. You might want to run away from that. Is that what they said to you as yeah, well? Yeah, because my dad's basic idea was you work hard in something you don't like, and then when you retire, then you can have the life you want. You know, that's, that, that's how they raised me. I mean, I'll tell you something very interesting, actually, just as an aside on this, that this is about sort of the values of um, expectations. So when I was, you mentioned I used to work at Channel 4 News. So before I used to work at Channel 4 News, I did some time on News at 10. And I used to, I used to live in Luton at the time. And so I used to commute from having worked on News at 10 back to Luton. And my mum used to say to me every night, where have you been? Why are you coming home so late? And I said, I've been working. She's like, what do you mean you've been working? I said, I was working till 10 o'clock. That's why I'm late. She's like, no job is anything after five or six o'clock. Where have you been since, the, since six o'clock? <laughs> because they couldn't conceive of a job that would finish at 10. Yeah. So, you know, the, the, that, that's the kind of world that, which, which I came from. So how, how did you make the leap then? So in the real world of what I really did, and I... You know, I just think if you come from a background where you don't know anybody, um, again, this isn't much about class than anything else, I think you just need to be a little bit cheeky and a little bit shameless and a little bit entrepreneurial. So the way I started my entire career was I was living in Manchester and I was unemployed, doing some temp work. And I remember I was watching a program. This was um, 95, I think, and it was about Oasis. It was on Granada TV, and I remember watching this late at night. I remember thinking, you know, having this sort of lightning bolt moment, thinking there is somebody whose job it was to just hang out with Noel and Liam Gallagher, talk to them. That sounds good. Sounds good. <laughs> they seem like they're quite good quote, good for quotes. Make a program about them, and that's that's what they get paid for. That's actually their job. How, how do you get a job where that's your literally what you do? And so I was watching the program and I just looked at the final name on the credits. And it was a woman called Janie Valentine. And so I rang up Granada TV the next day and I said, can I speak to Janie Valentine? And I said, look, I don't know anybody, but how do you do what you do? And to her credit, she said, come and have a coffee with me. And so I met her in the, in the reception of Granada TV. And she said, well, I can't give you my job, but um, I can give you two weeks work experience on a program called Granada Upfront. And I literally just did two weeks work experience and that led to six months work experience. And that's how it all started. Literally from a cold call thinking, who gets to do what you do? And that, and that, that is often the difference, isn't it? Between the people who are prepared to make the cold call. Yeah. And the people who, who aren't. I think there's a bit of that. And I think it's also, I think enthusiasm and genuine enthusiasm is, you know, because I, I, when it came to, for example, um, should I tell you about how I got this job when I was started at ITN? Yeah. Okay, this is quite interesting as well. So basically, in the summer of 95, which was, I'd just been doing some work experience at Granada. And um, I got, I was in living in Manchester and I, I, and I get a phone call and it says, um, come home because your dad's had a heart attack. So I drove, well, a friend of mine drove me through the night um, at the end of May 95, and my dad had a, had a heart attack, a sudden heart attack from the age of 62. And uh, he, it was a week, he was in a coma, and then he died a couple of days before I turned 24. And then my, basically my family said to me, you've got to come home, you've got to live in Luton now, because we're all, we're in problem, you know, we've got problems now. And we need to all sort of circle, circle the wagons and go home. And I remember thinking, that sounds like the right idea, but I know it's not really the right idea. And it was around about then that I saw an advert for an ITN graduate trainee scheme. And I thought, this is a permanent job. So it offers the stability that my dad had always gone on about. It's journalism, which offers the sort of, at that time, the respect and status that my dad talked about. And so I, I applied for it. And um, it was the only job I applied for because it was the only one that really, really I felt like and like I felt like I could do I could do. And I went back up to Manchester, and this is the bit that's interesting. I met this woman who had worked at ITN, and I sort of I don't know, I must have cold called her to say if she could give me some advice. And I went for a coffee, I went for a drink with her, and I started just chatting about all the stuff that had happened to me and blah blah blah. And at the end of it, I said, Can you give me any advice about how I could maybe get this job at this interview? And she said, You don't need any advice from me. I think you're gonna get it. 
And I said, why do you think that? And she said, because I've just spoken to you and I know that you can't afford not to get it. And I thought that was really interesting that when you literally don't have a plan B and there is that absolute like, if I had not got that job, I literally do not know what would have happened to my life. My dad had died in June and I got that job in September. And yeah, the, the following September. And I just don't know what would have happened. So I think there is a bit of desperation that actually helps. And I think that that's one of the things that I think if you come from a working class background, I think that's an advantage is that there's a certain hunger that you have that you might not have if, if you know that it will eventually be sorted. And, and do you think you had to be a bit selfish? Yeah. In selfish in what? In just terms of how you make your decisions? Yeah. I think you do. Yeah, I think you do. But it's about, I think... You know, because, because unlike most people in this country, there yeah. would have been expect There were expectations on you. Yeah. To look after the family, look yeah. after your mother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you didn't... You know, you didn't do that in the yeah. way that you were, was expected. No, you I think you're right. Your own cause. I think you're right. And I think you're right. And I think the thing about that then becomes about is the selfishness to some service as well as just not, you know, and again, that's a moot point. Yeah. For example, I'll give you an example. Like I'll give you a real world example to write a book that is as revealing as my book is. Right. My memoir, Greens for Bear is very revealing. And I say some stuff about what we were growing up and which is uncomfortable for my family, to be honest. This film is fiction, but it includes stuff that is quite emotional. So you could argue that it's quite selfish to be writing a book that is that revelatory and that intimate when do I have the really have the right considering I'm just one part of the family and you know that isn't that is a totally valid argument. My only thing is I think that it serves a greater purpose because it opens people's eyes up to a world which they most might not necessarily know, necessarily know, which might create a bit of empathy, which might be good for a greater understanding. But that's just my argument. You could argue that I am being completely selfish to write a book based on my experiences and, you know, um, and not really seeking the permission or the, or the confirmation or agreement of anybody else. But I feel like if you do it for the right reasons, if in some ways it serves a greater end, and that it's not just purely selfish, then I think it's uh, just about tolerable. Is that a mission of yours now? It's become more so, actually. Um, I mean, because we live in such depressing times. I'm, I'm quite lucky in a way, because I've got two young children and we try not to have the TV on when, when they're around. And that means I don't get to watch as much of what's going on in the world, because it just feels very, very bleak to me. And I say that as somebody who's, you know, has got a wife who's, white Scottish and children who are of mixed heritage. And I just feel like they are, I, I want to believe that when they grow up in this country as adults, both sides of their culture will feel endorsed and accepted and embraced. And that's, that just doesn't feel like that's happening in this country or in America. And so when I think about the choices I make about whatever talents I've got and what I can do with them, this idea of trying to stress commonalities but not in a kind of activist way and not in a sort of, you know, political way, but just through storytelling um, becomes quite important. I remember there was, I think it was the Westminster Bridge attacks um, happened a couple of years ago. And I remember somebody, somebody tweeted this quote from Mr. Rogers, which was, whenever anything bad happens, look for the helpers, because there's always somebody helping. And that really, really helped me. And I just thought, you know what, that's what I'm going to try and focus on now. So I'm, I'm working on a new book at the moment, which is about trying to understand why we've become divided, which is essentially looking at the helpers. And when it comes to empathy, you know, a story like this, which is, yes, a big, bold, musical, joyous, rites of passage, all of those things is true. But it's also a story where people in America are watching a story about a Pakistani immigrant and crying because they connect with them. And that's just got to be powerful. I mean, I, I remember I went to New York and I saw, I went to a screening and a couple of, um, a couple from New Jersey came up to me afterwards. And they were very big Springsteen fans, so that's why they'd gone and they were like raving about Springsteen and this, that and the other. And then I said, um, can I just ask you, have you ever spoken to a Pakistani Muslim? Have you ever met one? And they said, no. I said, is it interesting that you've just spent two hours being completely involved in this person's story and you haven't even mentioned that that's the case? And he just looked at me, he said, yeah, but you're just a Pakistani version of us. And I thought, that's kind of amazing to have been involved in a story where it's just that part is just passed on. Considering the times we live in now, where people of certain backgrounds are being told that they don't fully belong, or they're not particularly welcome, or if they don't do this. And I just thought that's the power of empathy. And that's why, you know, I wrote a recent piece saying that I think empathy is the weapon against division. 
And I just feel like if you find the things that are going on depressing right now, you know, one of the ways that we can make things better is just trying to remind us of the things that we've got in common. And storytelling can have some, can have a role alongside journalism, alongside everything else. Storytelling that just binds us together in some ways, you know, has some purpose. Because it's very interesting, I mean, thinking about what you used to do and what we do now. So yeah. In, in terms of journalism and exposing division and yeah. racism. Um, and, and thinking about that alongside what you've done with the movie, yeah, because the movie is a is a feel good movie, yeah, which which has racism within it, yeah. as a theme, and as you say, challenges invites people. But to... Do you know what I found limiting about working here? When I when I yeah, used to work, what I found, I mean, just speaking to what you've just yeah. said, is that I think journalism is you know is obviously incredibly important. I think one of the things you can do in storytelling in a film is be emotional. And I don't think emotion is allowed particularly when it comes to journalism, is it? You're meant to be slightly more down the line. Well, there, there, are, there, are, there are times journalism can be emotional, um, certainly, um, and when you, you will make things knowing that it's emotional, but you've got to be very careful with you've it got to be because careful. you can't manipulate it's people. It's got to be restricted. You, yeah. exactly, you can't manipulate. Whereas actually filmmakers actually want to manipulate. <laughs> So there's a final scene in the film which is very manipulative in a way. You know, the character, the camera very slowly pans in on the central character. He's crying. It's a very long take. It's utterly manipulative. It doesn't mean it's not heartbreaking. It doesn't mean it's not genuine and moving, but it is also manipulative yes. as well. And I actually like the idea of having emotion, sentimentality, whatever you want to put it, as part of the toolbox of storytelling. And I think that's why I went off into writing more, because, again, you can do that. And I think that, that journalism, you know, and I'm, I'm not blaming journalism. I think it's just it does a, serves a different purpose in some ways. But because you have to be more restrained, because you have to be more circumspect about being emotional, I think that means that the impact that it can have is a slightly different kind of impact. That's what I, that's what I wonder about, sort of the power of this particular type of storytelling. Um, and, and whether it may achieve more. I mean, at, at, the, at the time that we're recording this, we don't know because it hasn't hit the theatres. Sure. Yet. So, so your audiences, are, or I suppose, are test audiences and screenings. Yeah. And, yeah and that yeah. kind of thing. But I mean, so you so may have don't... gone straight to DVD by now. <laughs> so we don't know exactly how people react react to it. But I imagine people are going to react to it very well, and that it is going to have that that sense and I don't, of commonality. I mean, to be honest, I'm not even just you know, I'm sort of talking about this film because that's what I'm involved in. I'm not actually even just talking about this film. I just mean this I'm type just, of thing. This type of thing, exactly. And I just think that's it has some purpose. In the same way that comedy can have a purpose, you know, in the same way, you know, as having Tez Ilias appearing on you know, Channel 4 yeah. at 10 o'clock But that's going to be quite a challenge, isn't it, as we go through the next year? Because whatever happens, it's likely to get more turbulent yeah. than not. It is. It is. And... I don't think there's only one tactic about things. I just think if you feel, if you believe in hope, or if you want things to get better, you have to, you know, you can only do the things that you're good at in your own way. And I feel like, you know, sometimes one of the reasons I like to write journalism that's first person that's often nothing to do with my ethnicity at all is just to humanize and normalize things. You know, I think anything that normalizes that what looks different is helpful. You know, and some of that can be just about, you know, role models and people who are doing things and other things can be the stories you read. Every time I write something like or, or somebody tells me that they've seen this film and it's made them cry or affected them. I think that's progress because you have been emotionally committed to a story that outwardly some people would think you would have nothing in common with. And that I think that's kind of progress, you know, and I think the other thing that's really interesting about all of this stuff is, you know, the responsibility one feels when you've got kids. Because I genuinely do feel this because I feel like I don't want my kids to grow up with having any of the kind of angst and issues and challenges that I, I faced. Uh, that would be, you feel a responsibility, don't Do you not feel that? Yes, but I, I think my kids are a little bit older than yours and I suppose I'm learning that they will, just in a different way. You know, it's, it's not has to say the world... Called, has anyone called them any names based on their mixed, um, her mixed heritage? I'm not certain, to be honest. I think so, but I'm not certain. I'm kind of letting them get on with it to, to, to a certain degree. Have you um, ever talked to them about the fact that they might be considered... A bit. Right. A bit, but not, not, not a huge amount. Um, because they're just... I think they're just getting to that stage where that might become a thing. Yeah. I suppose what I mean is the world is definitely different now to how it was when... I was growing up and when you were growing up, we're not exactly the same age, but this is basically here is. But a lot of those prejudices are still there. And, and, I, and I find it quite surprising 
that we're still having to put up with it <laughs> or that our children are still having to put up with it in that sort of um, non, uh, you know, in your face way. I mean, a lot of the racism I grew up with was not aggressive, mm. you know, very hostile. It was that sort of friendly, I'm not racist, but here's a packy joke. Um, you know, I don't mean you, because um, we're all friends and that kind of stuff. Yeah. And I really thought those days had gone. Yeah. But I don't think they have. But I, 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 where we live now is quite close to Finsbury Park. And when that, the, the attack happened, which was at Darren Osborne, yeah. my daughter at that time was um, vainly trying to learn how to play violin. So I would take her to lessons. And we had to find a different route so that she would not see any of the media and all of that stuff. And so my whole thing at the moment, she's like eight, is to just not yet let her know that there are people who feel that for, for reasons that are outside of anything to do with her. You know, and the idea that at some point she's going to learn that it's the reason why she can't watch the film, because in the film there are scenes of racism. There's the, there's the use of the p words. I do. Oh, that's not, interesting. Well, I, because she's eight. Yeah. Because I watched the film and thought I really want my kids to watch this. Really? Yeah. I would just be heartbroken for them for her to. I don't want it to kind of that that consciousness to drop inside her to, to drop inside her purity at the moment that people would treat people and treat her their dad like that you know and so the idea that that would happen for me it would be like so the moment point? of i don't know it's just it feels like a kind of a moment when the world starts turning dark and i just want i don't want that world that happened to happen right now you know i mean that that's but that's quite challenging isn't it for it a, is. for, i mean if you're thinking you can protect your child from realities of the world yeah um for us for a few years yes I know it's an inevitable you know, I'd, moment. I've certainly been called names by the time I was eight. Um, an, I know it's I'm inevitable. Sure you had. But it's, it's an inevitable thing, but it feels quite hurtful. And that's why one wants to try and be on the side of good and to try and say, well, look, I'm trying to do my part in my own, my own way. Because I think, you know, I look back now and I just think how, you know, I never had, I don't remember my dad ever telling me, sitting me down and saying, you're going to be treated differently. And the reason that, you know, this person will not allow you into your, I had a friend who, you know, whose dad worked for, um, was a member of the NF and they he used to not allow, I was not allowed to come and visit his, you know, his house just literally because of that. Sorry, you, you know? had a friend whose dad was in the National Front? Yeah. And um, and if, interestingly enough, it turns out that my friend is now a member of the, my former friend is on a member of the BNP because then they released their, you know, when they leaked their membership list, he was on there. Um, but he was, yeah, he was my friend at school. And, but that weird thing, like, yeah, you can't, you can't obviously go to his, uh, his dad's house because you know what he's like, you know. But I never had, a, my dad never sort of sat down and said, these things will happen. That was just sort of a drip, drip, drip kind of information, you know. But the idea that my children might in some way have those kind of impact or those kind of things, just, it just, it feels really painful to me. So I, that's why, you know, in your own way, you want to try and protect them as long as you can, and then try and show them that there are good things, there are good people, there is other help, there are helpers, and that the world is not just like that. And so, you know, at some point, maybe she might watch the film, but I hope she sort of, you know, sees the good in it and the unity in it and, and isn't overwhelmed by the darkness of it. Are you, are you surprised by how big the film is? Completely. I mean, I genuinely, genuinely am, because... Firstly, just to get the film made is ridiculous. You know, that's that's unlikely. So I thought that was a triumph. And then I remember getting this phone call from Gorinda saying, it's going to, Sundance have accepted it. And I thought, well, that's amazing. And then she said, it's going to open in the 13, it's going it's to have its premiere in a 1300 seater cinema. And again, not a joke. I just thought they must have some lots of really big black curtains because to sort of cover up all the empty seats. Um, and then that night, 1300 people standing ovation. It's like, this is really connecting. And then we went to the after show and this woman comes up to me at the after show party. She said, I love your film. I work for um, New Line and I'm going to buy it. And I'm not, I'm not a film person. You know, I'm, I'm from this, I'm the world of journalism. So I was like, this is clearly just what people say as soon as they meet anybody in any party. So I treated it with the, uh, with the uh, contempt it deserved. Um, sure enough, the next day, there'd been a mass auction um, for the film. And, uh, and that woman had been the one who'd won. And Warner Brothers had, had bought it. And I was like, you do know this film is set in 1987 in Luton. And, and you, did you see the scenes of racism? And you know, and there aren't any stars in it. There's no stars in it. And you know, how, what are the commonalities? How are you going to do it? But they said, you know, we believe in this film. And the fact that they bought into it and the fact that there are now sort of posters in Sunset Boulevard for it is mind boggling. And what it shows me and again, we don't know how it's going to turn out yet, but what it shows me is this, this aspiration towards empathy, which is a theoretical aspiration, 
if you put the if you have the faith in it, if you get the story right, if you get the cast right, and if you get enough of an opportunity in terms of the muscle behind it, in terms of distributors, it can possibly reach people. You know, I'm getting people tweeting me from Omaha, Nebraska, saying I can't wait till opening day. I mean, how weird is that? Who, who turned it down along the way? Who didn't turn it down? Um, the interesting thing about that is the things that people are now saying is, success are, is, is great about it are all the things that people at the beginning said was totally wrong about it. So obviously, you know, the no stars thing. But they were like, well, it's set in 1987 and 16-year-olds. So today, 16-year-olds aren't going to watch it. And the people who were 16 are in their 40s, and they obviously just stay at home and watch TV because they can't get, they can't be bothered to to, to get child childcare. Um, and then the other thing that was really interesting about it was in every screening that we saw, nobody ever offered, as far as I can remember, ever offered any notes about the Asian characters. They just, it was only about the white characters, you know. And I thought it's really interesting how, you know, there was, I remember early on somebody said, "Is there any chance that the dad?" like my character's dad could be best friends with his white friend's dad because they could be best buddies because then they could possibly hire a star for that role. It's like the whole idea is that he lives in a hermetically sealed society and community where he doesn't know anybody. If he's his best buddies with Matt's dad, that hardly kind of creates the kind of, you know, s sense of oppression that the, that the kid is facing. So it was interesting how people, you know, kept saying, we don't find it plausible. We don't think it's going to necessarily work. And now all the things that people were saying about it the exact opposite, like, oh, it's, it's, it's not just about 16-year-olds or 14, it's universal. Yeah. And, oh, it's nothing to do with the Pakistani community. It's accessible and relatable. It's, and it's, it's, the, the, it's, the, it's not plausible uh, criticism that is particularly funny because it's yeah. essentially a true story. Yeah, well, I'll tell you what's very funny is somebody... Um, so uh, there's a friendship in the, in, the, in the thing between Javed, who's sort of my character, and a guy called Matt, who's in, as a white kid, and they're school friends. And, and Matt is kind of a cool kid who has a girlfriend. And he's kind of like has a slightly idealized kind of life. And, and my character kind of thinks, oh, my God, this is what life could be like if I was white and I had parents who kind of were cool, you know. And uh, one of the potential financiers, um, I remember Garinda texted me. She said, these people are saying that this relationship, this friendship is completely implausible because why would somebody like him be friends with him? And I actually had to text my friend Scott, who the character is based on, to say, Scott, um, could you just explain why we were mates when we were 10? Because there's some financiers that aren't buying it. What was his answer? He said, we didn't think about those big things. We just got on, you know. But it was interesting that I don't know whether people would have asked that question if the character hadn't been Asian, you know. It's like, I think the hurdle and the questions they asked were, the hurdle was higher and they asked more questions because it wasn't a world that they were familiar with. How, how do you feel now about being... Asian or Pakistani or whatever it is, because what you've described in many ways is a life in which you've partly rejected it, but also just got on with your own life. Mm. It, your life has not been characterized by being Pakistani. It's, no. it's been characterized by what you're interested in, whether that was journalism or Springsteen or music or yeah. whatever it was, or writing a film or writing a book. Um, and yet you're almost kind of trapped by it as well, aren't you? Um well, you know what I think? So I just, I suppose I'm now more aware of the broadness and flu and porousness of labels. Do you know what I mean? So I'll give you an example of what I mean is over the last, you know, 20 years or whatever, in my own way, I've done some things to add to the mix of the stories that are out there. You know, in my own small way, I've done a few articles and whatever. So whatever the story of being British is, I've made some small contribution to that. In terms of being a Pakistani, yes, I was born in Pakistan, I've been raised here. And yes, I happen to like Springsteen, and yes, I've married who I've married to, and yes, I live the life. I think all I've done is in some ways hopefully stretch the boundaries of what it means to be Pakistani a little bit so that people don't just think it only has to be that thing. I'm not saying I'm only one person who's just done a little bit. So I guess those labels don't... I feel more comfortable with all those labels because I don't think those labels necessarily need to mean that you have to be behaving in a particular way. You can be Pakistani and be fairly secular. You can be Muslim and still believe that there is something culturally interesting about the religion, but not necessarily believe that, you know, have to be particularly dogmatic or believe that everybody needs to wear a particular kind of clothes. All these labels can be a bit freer and a bit looser. And therefore, I feel more comfortable with all of them because I don't think they have to absolutely be defining you in, the, in that way. When, when the news was all about extremists in Lucent. Yeah. When is the, when is the news well, not, not about that? <laughs> 
uh, or, you know, and terrorists or terror suspects. Did you feel that had anything to do with you or that you had anything to say about it? I tell you what I felt. I felt exhausted by the number of people who would contact me asking me to have a view about it. Um, and, you know, people would say, you know, as somebody who's also from that town, could you explain why these things are happening? So I think there was more of that shorthand that went on. I did feel, I, what I felt was mystification that I came from those same streets and I turned out this way and it's possible to live on literally those same streets and end up deciding that you prefer going to Syria rather than going into, into, the, into the, what used to be the Arndale. And the fact that it's so near did have some connection to me. It wasn't like, oh yeah, these are just, it's just like, how can you literally live in the same streets and make that decision? But then there's a bit of me that also feels that about Tommy Robinson. Because Tommy Robinson's also from Luton and he grew up in fairly the same town. And there's a bit of me that thinks, how can you have grown up in that and then end up there? So those journeys, you do feel a greater sense of, not responsibility, but I think a greater sense of curiosity as to why would somebody go and decide this when I didn't? I mean, could the answer to that be that, that um, the situation isn't as important as we all think? You know, that the circumstance of Luton and the way Luton was mm, is, mm. is not the thing that creates any of those things. No, I think it's to do with the, well, it might be some of that. I think it's also to do with what is around you in terms of who are the influences that you have around you? Where do you, where do you see, to go back to the original thing, where do you see the window that takes you to a different place? You know, that's what I think. I mean, not just about Luton, but all these places where I've been traveling around, you know, where is the window, where is the version of Springsteen? Doesn't have, you know, whatever, that tells them, you know what, you don't actually have to marry your, your, first cousin or you'd have to have an arranged marriage and actually to be honest it's actually fine to have friendships with somebody who's white and and you know what it's actually like having like a, a relationship with somebody who's not a muslim is not the worst thing in the world and and you don't have to just aspire to these things where's the window that tells you that if you grow up in a community where everybody is very similar and i think that's possibly the reason why those things happen more i suppose any 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 casual viewer of of the movie will say, well, I wonder what's happened with his parents now. Mm. Obviously, your father's passed away. Mm. Um, what does your mum think? The siblings in the family are fictionalised. My mum is, I think she so doesn't understand that it could ever be that this could become a film. So she hasn't seen it yet. She hasn't seen it? No. Why not? Um, because I don't think they can get their head around it. I mean, I... I she doesn't I want to see it? I, 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 I don't... But the truth with my mum is that she is... She's in her mid 80s and she's got the early stages of dementia now. And so it's one of those things. It's a really, really weird experience where her memory is fading and going just at the point where I am trying to preserve the memory of her, you know. So she can't, she does know about it, but I don't know whether she would actually be able to psych take in the reality of what it is. And that's a, that's another very weird feeling that, you know, some, that happens with people who are aging parents, you know, this idea that they're somehow slipping away from you. And so I went home a couple of weeks ago, actually, and I was look, just looking after my mum for a day. And it was such a weird experience because she's there, she's chatting and stuff. And I'm like, you know, I just went to a screening where your life was on that screen. And I saw a young version of you making those dresses and doing all these things. And I was kind of like venerating you on this screen. And, and now... I so much just see you as this fragile person who's forgetful and frail and, you know, as a bit of a challenge to look after. And it was really, really inspiring and to be reminded that this person in front of me, this frail person, is the same person who is responsible for why I'm getting to do the things that I'm doing, you know? Um, but the truth is, I think she wouldn't really fully yet understand quite the enormity of what it's like to, to be on the big screen. But I hope that in some way, the, 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 the sacrifices she made have been sort of represented in some way in the film. And what about your sister? Because she's also in the movie. Yeah, well, my sister is quite heavily fictionalised, um, but she went to see it and uh, she found it very, very emotional. It was very interesting. She said that the things she found most emotional were not the things that you might think, because there are some kind of moments which feel big. She said the bit that made her really cry was um, my dad used to always wear a suit regardless of where he was. And when he was unemployed, he would go to the job center in his suit. And there's a scene where he's signing on and he's just coming out wearing a suit. She said it made her think about all the times where 
she would see those things, but never spend any time trying to get into his head to think, what must it be like for him? This proud guy, sort of humiliated in a way to be surrounded by all these people where he thinks he, you know, he, he could be doing better, but he's not able to. And the fact that we were too young to give any time to thinking about him as a human being and just instead thought, oh God, he's at home now, which our fun's over. That guilt and that sense of, um, that lack of empathy, what she found that really, really moving. Have you, have you had any thoughts about why it is? I mean, at the moment, the news is dominated by, uh, partly by Brexit, but also by what has caused all the division that we've mm. been talking about and, and the Brexit vote. And a lot of people believe it's a lot to do with fro frozen or falling living standards after the financial crash of 2008. Yeah. And this prolonged period of economic difficulty that ordinary people have faced. Yeah. The 80s was a prolonged period of economic difficulty, mass unemployment in a way that we haven't seen yeah. since, three million unemployed and, and, and more, and people who would lose their jobs and never work again. Yeah. Have you had any thoughts about why that period did not produce division, but actually led to a period of um, progressive thinking and change? Whereas this period... Has, when you say progressive thinking, when did that happen? Well, I suppose in the, towards the 90s, you know, right. the, the mid-90s and, yeah. and, and the birth of new labour and all, and all of that, that. What I mean is that period of terrible economic deprivation yeah. did not lead to an economic revolution or a political revolution yeah. the way we have seen here. Uh, it, it led to change. I mean, we don't know where it's going to lead to right now. I, I mean, one thought I have, I haven't thought about it fully, but I think one thing to do is that the 80s led to the Labour Party having to rethink itself as well, didn't it? Thatcherism led to the Labour Party having to kind of work itself out and work out how does it respond to Thatcherism, which ultimately led to Tony Blair. And in a way, Tony Blair was sort of, you know, sort of almost genetically programmed as a way of responding to all that stuff. So New Labour became something like that. And I just wonder whether at the moment we've got the politics or the politicians on that side, on the, on the Labour side, who are thinking in a way to be able to counter the things that are going on in terms of the Conservatives. So I feel like maybe the political debate at the moment doesn't feel like it's having any original... The original thinking, if it's coming, it's coming from the Nigel Farage's and from, from the Brexit Party, etc., in terms of coming up with a narrative about Britain, Boris Johnson now as well, um, and I don't think that a counter narrative, which could then lead to progression or change or a challenge to some of the things you're talking about. I don't think there is anybody who is leading that counter narrative in a political way, in the way that you could argue that Blair and New Labour did to respond to some of the impact of Thatcherism. Because you need some, if, if you've got some difficult, dark things going on, you need someone who's pointing the light somewhere. And I don't see that politically at the moment. And I think that that means that in terms of hope, I still want to believe that Britain isn't a, a nasty, mean, vindictive place. I don't want to believe that some of the things that we've talked about, the resurgence of this and uh, of some of the hatreds and the, and the intolerance, I don't want to believe that that is actually Britain. I kind of want to believe that it's still essentially a decent place and some people have been, you know, misled and they have gone down and made decisions politically that don't necessarily represent how they feel in their hearts, basically, you know? But I also feel like we don't have the leaders that represent those views at the moment. And so there are, so there is nobody speaking for the tolerant middle, assuming there is, they are in the middle. We ask everybody here, um, you know, if, if you could change the world, mm. how, how you would change it. And I suppose you've talked about empathy and, and the way you, you think, see that as a way to, to move us on as a society, would, would that be the way you that would That would be one, but I've already said that. I think the other thing I would change is, I feel like one of the things that's affecting this world this particular, at this particular moment, there's two things I think. One is I think there's a sense of entitlement. I think the people who, who, who are raised with a sense of entitlement are really doing this country in. If there was a way of sort of trying to kind of challenge this sense of self-entitlement, that there are people who, 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 who grow up because of the colleges and the universities and the schools they go to and because of the circles they inhabit, they grow up with this entitled sense that they know better and they ought to rule. And there's a whole load of other people who may be at least as well, comp as, just as competent, but who grow up with the exact opposite sense that they can then do it. And I feel like that sense of entitlement is one of the reasons why we're in this place, you know? That it's not necessarily the best people who are running our country, but they're the people who feel most entitled to. 
So I think that would be something that would I would do. And I think the other thing, and it kind of goes back to your, you know, what you're doing here and what have you, is to try and remind ourselves that there are such things as truths and that opinions are not the same thing. And I think that one of the things that's changed since the time I was here is just the sense that just because you can tweet something doesn't make it real, that just because you can post something doesn't make your point as valid as, some, as somebody who's actually been there. And I think that is really corroding debate right now, which is impacting on anything. So no matter how horrific something is, somebody could just say it's fake news. And, and that's not even a political point. I just think it's a culturally really, really dangerous moment. So if we can just remind ourselves that some things really are true, that would be good. And if we can sort of remind ourselves that just because somebody feels that they're entitled to run the country, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're qualified to. That might be useful too. Is that entitlement something that you really encountered when you were breaking into journalism? I'll answer that by saying on the first day that I started at ITN, or the first week I started here, actually, there was, we had to go through this sort of, um, you know, course, sort of an entry course. And I remember somebody saying, could you, there were four of us, and they said, could you tell us when you first decided you wanted to be a journalist? And each of the other three said something around about the age of 11 or 12. And I said about 24, which was the year before I'd started. It's like, how can you have decided at the age of 11 you were going to do this? So I think that answers your question, that, you know, there's people and other, who just feel like this is something, that there's a road that they could have gone on. And then there are other people who just, you know, they never believed it could happen until it does, because it's just they just weren't raised with that level of um, that level of ambition or or the idea or the promise that they could do that. What and, would be uh, your advice to to people like you when you were younger or parents of people like you? Um, do you know what my advice them, would be? Right. My advice would be don't think they're better than you. Don't even think you're equal to them. Think you're better than them genuinely think you're better than them. Because I think, my, one of my favorite quotes is Booker T. Washington, who says, success is measured not where you get to in life, but by the obstacles you have overcome to get there. So I just feel to anyone, if you come from an ordinary-ish background and your parents didn't know anybody in the media or whatever job, and then you get there, you're not the same as the people, the posh people, you're better than them because nobody thought you could get there. And so walk around as if you not only deserve it, but you deserve it more than the other people. Safras Manzur, thank you very much indeed for sharing your ways to change the world and telling us the story of your life. That was a great, great pleasure. I hope you enjoyed that. If you did, then please do give us a rating and a review. Our producer today is Rachel Evans. Until next time, bye-bye.